usable floor area. Now, do we have the usable floor area defined in our definitions? No, we don't. So how are we going to address that? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, it is defined in the in the zoning bylaw, and that's the definition that would be used. Is it titled usable floor area or habitable floor area? Through the mayor, we'd have to check, but I do believe it was usable the last time I looked at it. I don't have a zoning bylaw with me. So if it's usable, would you define that as the inside of the walls or cupboards or closets or stairways? Or, or are you backing that out? It's all based on definitions here. Again, I'm going to have to go from memory. I believe that when I've last used usable floor area, it excluded furnaces. Um, in apartments, it excluded um, ventilation systems. Uh, the the entrance ways, things like that that were common. Um, oh, here I've got it in front of me now. Thanks, Matt. So it means the total area of all floors of a building, outdoor patios or cafe or dwelling unit, including a hallway, aisle, stairway or and corridor within a suite or unit, an internal law wall, I'm sorry, and partition within a suite or unit a storage room and storage area within a suite or unit, a boat slip in the case of a boathouse, and a habitable room or dwelling in the basement of a dwelling. But it excludes an area occupied by a common area, which is what I was talking about, the entranceway to an apartment building, um, and exclude, excludes the mechanical shaft, excludes a vestibule, uh, not within a dwelling unit, excludes a garage attached to a building, and it excludes an unfinished basement in a dwelling used for storage or laundry. And it says the usable floor area for a dwelling is measured from the outside face of exterior walls or to the center line of party or common walls. The usable floor area for all other buildings shall be measured from the inside face of exterior walls, interior common walls, and firewalls. Did I hear you say it includes boathouses? In the case of a boathouse, it includes the boat slip. So in Long Point, because this is a hazard land designation for shoreline policies, that the, a boathouse would be included in their, in their usable floor area, as opposed to how we had it, which was building foundation area? So a boathouse is a different use than the cottage or the different dwelling unit types we have. So what this definition is talking about is, as I recall, the boathouse is permitted to be a, up to a certain size. When you're calculating the size of that boathouse, you have to count the boat slip within that boathouse. That's what that's about, not the dwelling unit. I don't know, that seems pretty convoluted but I'll get to that after I guess now on the next one here section 4 on the page before that 131 you have under under hazard land designation you have permitted uses and it says here remove camping facility does that mean like camping as in we must tell our children not to pitch a tent by the stream and we're going to enforce that through bylaw through the mayor, that section is referring to marinas, and it mentions that they are permitted to have restaurants, and there's a few other uses, and then it says something about camping. What the Conservation Authority comments are, to my understanding, saying is permitting overnight accommodation, the camping within the marina is adding additional risk to public safety. It's not saying take away what's currently there, it's saying not to add any more camping to anything new. Just so I'm clear, so the marine is a long point where they offer, where they have trailers. They're not allowed to pitch a tent by the trailer? They have camping now and would continue with what they have because that's currently in policy, it's currently existing. It's about new 
uses. New uses. So, marinas, if there was to be another one, wouldn't be able to do this? Through the mayor, that's what the Conservation Authority is recommending to council. Okay. And now, uh, the last one on the list is the safe access and egress. Okay. We know it's not possible. So, how do we resolve this issue? Have you experienced that before, Mr. Rayner? Because Turkey Point, unless you raise the roads up 1.6 meters, you don't have it. I asked the province when they came to us at the Conservation Authority if they would be willing to pay for it. They said no. You, you can't make a grid and flood everybody out by raising your road. No. Uh, raising the road probably wouldn't even solve the issue because the, there's all the land that's around the road and in the Long Point area. The, the only thing, I, area that in my, in my experience, that where you can have some special policies and provisions and regulations relating to the floodplain is to have a special policy area designation. Um, and that, um, I, quite a large area in Brantford has a special policy area because of the, it's within the floodplain of, of the Grand River, uh, even though parts of it is protected by dike. The one can, concern here um, in, in Norfolk is that the provincial policy statement uh, with respect to special policy areas relates to river-based floodplains. It doesn't relate to uh, coastal floodplains for major, major lakes, uh, such as Lake Ontario, Lake Erie. So to, um, to have that special policy area um, would be difficult at, uh, in, the, in the current circumstance. So, but the, the county um, could lobby or, and try to get that into, into the PPS. The, the other thing is to, and as suggested by the uh, uh, Conservation Authority, is to further examine the, uh, the means to provide safe access, uh, to examine the, uh, the, uh, the uh, basically the impact of, of water, the likelihood of, of uh, water, the, the, the depth of water that might occur in, in a flood, the frequency of the flood events, uh, where that would occur, um, and the other, and then take a look at the other hazards and, and perhaps map them, which would be mapping the dynamic uh, beach uh, area within within those areas. So there's a lot of investigation that might be you might be able to do to minimize might minimize the risk involved in in expansions or redevelopment of of cottages and, and homes in that area. And so. We have uh, recommended some wording that you, you might want to consider to, to deal with the conservation authority's concern. Um, and it's, it's in, on page 19 of the staff re uh, report. It says that, uh, and it, it deals with, I think, all of the items on, in, in number three, that council may undertake a comprehensive investigation of the means by which the issue of safe access may be resolved and or pursue a special policy area designation to provide for flood proof development and redevelopment including policies relating to the scale of development or redevelopment that will reduce flood damage potential over the long term so. thank you for that now I see that it's, it's on the right on page 131 as well, that the county commit to undertake a comprehensive investigation of means to resolve the safe access issue. But it seems to me that we were just here not that many months ago thinking that an emergency access plan would have resolved that as well, but apparently it didn't. I, I don't think Councillor Hyde will be moving that forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first two questions are on those same two points that my colleague has raised, and I feel equally, I guess, disappointed in the comments from the Ministry, and I'll deal with them in reverse order to what Councillor Height did, and 
So first I'm, I'm concerned about the suggestion that we would remove the sentence or the last paragraph that talks about, this is in section, yeah, page 49 of our agenda. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, page 106 of our agenda, I think. No, that's not right either. Got so darn many references. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this, this deals with the policy that we, the council put into the OP amendment relating to re redevelopment and replacement of existing cottages and the wording we had approved may be permitted subject to the provision of safe access notwithstanding the policies of section 3.2.2. And the reason why, based in the staff report this evening, staff are suggesting that that paragraph be removed was based on that comment letter we received from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs to our, our emergency response plan that Councillor Height referred to, that we had a lot of discussion about, staff put a lot of effort in, we reviewed it last summer, said we think this does address the, the issue of safe access and egress and safety to residents and visitors and forwarded it to the Ministry. Their comments came back, we got them I think uh, in November or so, and the wording they say is, MMA suggests that the purpose of the document is not to demonstrate that there is safe access, but to provide an emergency response strategy for those two resort communities. Well, that's fine. That's, that's what they can suggest. And it calls for more information regarding flooding from, March, or from the marsh and the inner bay, etc. It's concerned that this report, as currently presented, may suggest that there is safe access and thus allow for a greater level of development. The whole point of that paragraph that we put in there was for the very limited scenarios where existing cottages were to be replaced or redeveloped. And we all acknowledge, I think, in every case where that might happen in the future, by, by requirement, the new cottage would be raised and floodproofed and therefore made safer than the scenario of any existing cottage. So I fail to understand how the ministry feels that paragraph would make life in Turkey Point or Long Point more risky than it is today. I simply cannot understand that. And so for that reason, I personally don't support deleting that paragraph. And with respect to the 50, meter, the 50 square meter one, that Councillor Height raised, 50 square meters, and they want the, the reference to uh, relative to the foundation area changed to relative to the usable floor area. It's still a, a, an abstract of 50 square meters that the policy would allow. So I, once again, I don't really understand why they would feel that wording would be better than the foundation area. In fact, if anything, the usable floor area of a cottage could be far, far greater than the foundation area. And if, if it was a percentage increase, which I think we originally had talked about, that might have made more sense. So I guess my question, Mr. Mayor, to the planner on that one in particular is, how is it that changing the wording from 50 square meters relative to the foundation area to 50 square meters relative to the usable floor area of the cottage is going to make it safer? I simply can't understand that. So, I don't know whether either Matt or Mary can help us on yeah, that. Yeah, we'll see. Right. We'll do what we can, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, my understanding of the recommendation to change to um, usable floor area, not foundation area, is because that's the term that's used in the ministry guidelines. And I believe the 50 square meters is also something that comes out of the ministry guidelines. So that's why we're getting these comments. Um, when I just try fresh to read that paragraph that council added, that last paragraph, when I read it, if you do not have safe access, there is no development, no redevelopment, no replacement. That's, if you just read it as the text says, it says there'll be nothing because we don't have safe access. So it seems to me that that's not council's intention. You'd still like cottagers to be able to replace or repair their cottages. And so that's why staff's recommending it be removed, 
or that you change it to read, I think what's in the CA comments are that you change it to say that that other section will apply, instead of notwithstanding, that you go by the policies that are in that section. So it gives you, the CA comments give you a couple of options to look at. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yes, it does, Mary. On the first one, I guess, relative to the usable floor area versus the foundation, I think if staff can give council assurance that it, it wouldn't affect the ability of a cottage owner to make an addition to their cottage, because it's a maximum of 50 square meters in any event, then maybe we can, I can live with that recommended change. With respect to the other one about section 7.3.2.2, in other words, our original draft said notwithstanding those policies, the LPRCA is suggesting remove the reference to subject to providing safe access, but leave in the reference to section 7.3.2.2. What does 7.3.2.2 say? In other words, why would we have put it notwithstanding that policy and the LPRCA is, is saying make it subject to that policy. Can you help me on that one? It's a, uh, you, Mr. Mayor, it's a fairly lengthy policy okay. that uh, you would find on page 82 of the track changes version of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the amendment. We're not really um, really the only policy in that shoreline um, floodplain policies that we are, are adjusting as, as the one that we just talked about in terms of the ground um, the, the uh, usable floor area or ground or foundation area, that issue. That's really the only change that okay we're making. The rest of it is, is staying as, as it is in okay. the official plan today. And, and that's been used by the Conservation Authority to have some flexibility in, in dealing with uh, um, rebuilding or construction or, or whatever in, on the cottages and houses in, the, in those two areas. So, um, If you want, I can read it all, but it is no. it's fairly lengthy. I, I appreciate that, Matt, and you don't need to read it. I think, Mr. Mayor, essentially it says, in essence, that, that uh, cottages could be replaced or redeveloped provided they're adequately flood-proofed by current engineering standards. That's the gist of, I think, 7.3.2.2. Yes. Okay, thank you. And that, to me, that would be acceptable. Thank you. Do you want to continue, Matt? Please. Yeah. So, you know, we we have uh, recommended in in the staff report that that paragraph that was added by council be revised to say redevelopment or replacement of existing development may be permitted subject to the provisions of section three seven point three point two point two of the hazard land designation. So. We think that better reflects the intent of, of council. So, um, it's me now. Where? Me now. I'll leave it to Mary to do the rest of it. <laughs> we worked out a plan here in advance. We better stick to it. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, the next section I would like to talk about is some of the correspondence that's attachment four to the report. There are um, letters and emails from uh, several landowners and agents uh, related to Hastings Drive. And I'm sure you'll hear more from them tonight in the public comments, but I just wanted to point to you that Hastings Drive was not in the terms of reference specifically mentioned the way the housing study was or the natural heritage uh, strategy was mentioned. Um, it is a project that's big enough that I think it would have needed special mention in, in the plan. At this point, when we're at the final stages, I don't think it's an appropriate time to stop 
and go back and do all of those studies, set out budget and all those sorts of things to do it. So I just wanted to mention that to you tonight. Um, the other thing that we wanted to mention to you, because there's letters again from uh, David Rowe in particular, uh, regarding, and I think there's one on your desk too, to do with a, an urban expansion for Port Dover. And again, you're going to hear from them later tonight, but we wanted to update you that the Hamlet expansions were in what went to the report to the Municipal Affairs in June. Based on what came back from them, staff removed those expansions except the ones that were supported by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. So almost 50 hectares was added to the Hamlet areas just by matching the zoning and the Hamlet boundaries. But there were uh, in front of you back before June proposals to expand, and I'm not going to get them all, but Andy's Corners, Walsh, and a variety of different ones. And what staff has done is have taken those ones out, which were not supported by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. So you need to have that clearly in your mind tonight. There was no clear direction given in November when we came to you with the comments. So we need direction from you tonight for sure as exactly what you want us to do with those expansions. There was one for Villanova, which we left in because the ministry said if it's exactly the same in and out, we're fine with it. So we left that one. But you need to be clearly aware that that's what has been done and is in the bylaw that's in front of you tonight. Um, with that, then I'd like to conclude our presentation of the report to just say that it's been a long and complicated process. It's had a lot of public comment and input, many public meetings, a lot of background reports were done as required by the province in a variety of different topics. There's a lot of improvements to the official plan policies that are here that will help businesses. And we wanted to um, bring that point to your attention because there's a lot of people out there that aren't here tonight that we don't hear much from that are waiting for these changes so that they can go forward with things they would like to do. So we would be advocating that as soon as council's comfortable that we do in fact move forward with adopting this official plan amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Height, please. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Luke. Uh, through you to planning, uh, I know we, we spoke of the Hamlet expansions, and the reason why they couldn't be expanded is because Norfolk has an excess of lots in its inventory. Now, uh, I did receive the report from you with all the different lots and appreciate all of that. Now, using the handy-dandy Norfolk GIS tool, I'm able to view those lots. A lot of the ones that I view, you couldn't create a lot because you couldn't build a building on it because it wouldn't meet the requirements. So now you need a minor variance. So were those included in those factors? Because I looked at a pile of them. And without that minor variance, you're not building anything. It's uh, been a while since I did that report, but um, lots that did not meet the um, zoning bylaw standard were not included as a potential law. It is recognized that some might be able to get a minor variance but, uh, and, and ultimately be buildable, but um, any lots that um, were in the hazard land designation or, or which didn't leave enough developable land um, or a, a environmentally sensitive designation or did not meet the size standard or the frontage standard, um, of, of a buildable lot in the hamlet, from what my recollection is, were not included as a potential lot. So then planning staff went over each of those lots and looked at them? Because I've gone over a pile of them, and they're on your list. Through the mayor, I believe I looked at some of them, but I, no, I did not go through every one of them. So it could be that there's a whole bunch of lots out there that are restricting the Hamlet expansion and they're not buildable? That, that could be without a more extensive study being happened or to take place? 
Through the mayor, I'm pretty confident that our consultant did look at the zoning bylaw, the frontages and the sizes that we required when he did his study and provided it to us. Okay, I guess I have to disagree with that, Mr. Mayor, because some friends of mine just built a house and the county allocates them three lots. They have one. I know several other ones around me. It's not like I don't get out and see things, these things. I get calls from people all the time saying that they have these lots that they can't build on them. So if we can't expand the, the hamlets, we can't build on the lots, what are we doing with this stuff? But I'll leave it at that for now, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll redirect the calls to planning. Uh, I guess my last comment has to do with municipal affairs. Uh, Oxford County is doing their official plan review right now, and I don't see any reference to municipal affairs on, with their comments to their plan, and all of a sudden, like, we, we can't get enough, like, this guy can't get enough of us for some reason. I, I don't know what it is, Mr. Mayor, like, did we secretly employ this guy to help us with the, the official plan? Like, every single comment comes back, no. No, we're not allowed to. Like, I feel like somewhere in this building we have this guy on a desk going over this stuff. How is this, is this happening and why? Through the mayor, I believe I talked with Oxford about our terms of reference and provided it to, to them within the last year. So they're probably at phase one. They haven't got to the phase yet where they have to take it to the ministry and get their comments. Councillor Columbus. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted some clarification on page 136 of this agenda package, and it talks about forestry. It's the forestry section where the uh, drip line is to be expanded from 10 meters to 120 meters. Extent of adjacent land for significant woodlands has been changed from drip line plus 10 meters to 120. Why? Why are we so drastically increasing this drip line distance? Through the mayor, that distance is what is in the technical guidelines that uh, we are to use, and so we are just in con being consistent with it. it. Yes, it is a big increase. I hadn't noticed it until the ministry pointed it out. And are all other municipalities following that same distance? All other municipalities following the same guideline? Yes, that guideline is a provincial guideline. So it's involved in the P provincial policy statement. Then. We can't do much about it then. Sorry, it's not in the provincial policy statement itself, but it's in the technical guidelines that go along with it that the ministry uses for natural heritage features. So if someone wants to build something a hundred meters from the drip line, they would have to come here for a variance, is that it? Through the mayor, the process is they would come to planning staff and we would, if they're needing a planning approval, they would come to planning staff and we would um, have them look at an environmental impact study, what might be required or might, what might not. So it's possible they might be doing a certain kind of foundation that would not likely have any impact. So there's, there's things that can be done so that it wouldn't have an impact. But yeah, the ministry is requiring us to have a look at it. Well, that's unfortunate. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor Oliver. Mr. Mayor, just on that same one, I had red flagged and wanted to ask Mary about that as well. And Mary, I'm somewhat familiar with the technical guideline and the, the, the operative word being guideline. Uh, the policy we had before, which was the drip line plus 10 meters. So in other words, an EIS, for the furthest point out on whatever significant woodlot line you have is the drip line, and then you go another 10 meters. So another 35 feet beyond that, and anything within that zone would be subject to an EIS. Given the fact that it is a guideline, Mary, uh, would council have the prerogative to leave the policy as we have it now, i.e. subject to an EIS if it's 10 meters or less from the drip line adjacent to a significant woodland. Is that something we could do? Through the mayor, council certainly could. Um, there probably should be some kind of a technical basis for it, but uh, we could put it forward. It's up to well, you. I, I guess the technical basis would be that, that 
based on, on my 30 years experience in that field, I can't imagine a single scenario where a development 120 meters away from the edge, in other words, over 350 feet away from the edge of a woodlot, would have a negative impact on that woodlot and therefore be required to do an EIS. It just does not make sense. I realize that's not a technical answer, but I think it's a practical answer. I agree. Um, what I'd like to do is turn to the public and get their comments. There will be an opportunity to, um, for more questions from council to staff later, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, what I'm going to do in uh, looking for public input, I'm going to ask first if, first if there is anyone present that wishes to speak in favor, in favor, in favor. Sometimes people get confused as to when they'll have a chance to get in on the conversation. In favor, David. And uh, after that, I'm going to ask if there's members of the public that would like to speak in opposition or just neutral in general questions or comments, okay? So, having said that, are there any members of the public who wish to speak in favor of any aspect to the proposed amendments of this official plan? In favor. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. My apologies. Yeah, in favor? Come forward, yes. And we need, we'll need people's names. Some we know, but there's a sheet there. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, council, staff, um, we own a pro my sister and I both own properties, uh, 87 Hastings and 107-109 uh, Hastings. And we've reviewed the staff report on DCS 18-07. And as you know, Hastings Drive has already been comprehensively studied. An extensive hearing before the Ontario Municipal Board has just been completed last week, and there should be no further steps taken on Hastings Drive while the matter is with the Ontario Municipal Board for consideration. There should be no piecemeal approach to planning for Hastings Drive and no site-specific amendments to the official plan for individual lots on Hastings Drive. I'm opposed to any official plan process or any amendment to the site-specific designation of Hastings Drive that already exists in the current official plan. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the present who wishes to speak in favor of the proposed amendments? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak against or neutral? I'll start here first. David, I see your hand as well. There's many hands. Mr. Colomea, please. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. As I'm familiar to you, but not to the public, my name is Nathan Callman. I'm a local municipal and real estate lawyer. You'll be pleased to hear that I'm uh, here before you this evening to only speak to one matter regarding the uh, proposed official plan amendment. I have reviewed the uh, staff report uh, DCS 1807, and I'm frankly, I'm disappointed with respect to uh, Long Point's comments. And I'd like to first draw you to page 19 of the staff report. I believe it's page 106 of your materials. <clears throat> and staff circulated the uh, draft amendment uh, and, and LPRCA provided comments. And if I could turn you to that page and I'll read it out. There are some wording changes 
recommended in comments one, two, four, five, and six, which staff and the planning consultant support. It should be noted that item six in the LPRCA comments, referring to section 7.3.3.2, subsection F, of the plan relates to text that was specifically added to the proposed amendment through direction from council. According to the LPRCA, the replacement of existing buildings or structures within the shoreline hazard areas to be consistent with the PPS and the ministry guidelines should be limited to an increase of 50 meters squared to the original usable floor areas and not to the foundation area of the building as directed by council. <clears throat> now, these recommendations are nominally to be more consistent with PPS and technical guidelines, but if we look at the actual source documents, we find that it's simply not true. And I'd like to draw you to, <coughs> excuse me, to the handout that I have provided to you. <coughs> and as you'll read from the, the first page, and there's an email that I received from uh, LPRCA staff. There's no talk of habitable floor area. Only the ground, ground floor level is referred to. And further, if you look into the second page of the handout that I provided to you, please. <coughs> and there's some, some highlighted sections. It's even more favorable than what's been proposed for your policy. It contemplates foundation area and percentages, 50%, 30%, depending on the hazard that's contemplated, or market value even. So in short, the recommendations have been put forth by the conservation area and supposedly supported by your staff and the consultant are really sharks dressed in minnow costumes. And they're, they're wh gradual whittling away of what's possible. If you look at, if we take the technical guidelines at their face value, they are by far the most favorable. So how is it that the Conservation Authority can recommend a severe restriction of potential development and say, oh, well, it's just to be in support, you know, to be more consistent with our technical guidelines where it obviously isn't true. So what I recommend is that you stick with your wisdom as you have drafted uh, the policy and to not adopt the proposed changes to your draft amendment as suggested by the Conservation Authority, the Conservation Authority and your staff. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Colomeo? All right. Thank you, Mayor Luke. Uh, through you to the deputation, the, the second handout they gave us, which is the summary for, of considerations for preparing recommended guidelines for existing development within the hazardous lands, is that from the MNR Tech Guide? Yes, those are from the Tech Guides. Yeah, it looks very much like it. And, and you're saying what what you what we've received from the CA and from planning is is more stringent than what they recommend? Of course it is, because it, it's and I, I had this. Um, this has been an ongoing matter with the Conservation Authority because their own policies are, are very vague. Well, what happens, and I guess the best way to illustrate is if you think of a two-story structure. Let's say right now if you have a, just a small one, uh, you know, one floor level cottage and say, okay, well, you can increase it, but only by, you know, this percentage. Well, the problem becomes is what if you want a second story? I have situations where if you follow strictly what this Conservation Authority is re uh, recommending, well, you can increase your foundation a little bit, and then maybe you can have a third of a second floor. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, if we're talking about preventing hazards, I mean, how much, how much load on a, on a lot does, does you know, a few, uh, few drywalls add? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. The level of hand-holding is, 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 you know, insane. You know, we, we should let engineers do their job. If it can be shown that it can be safely engineered with minimal risk, then, I mean, w you know, why should we restrict it and come up with these arbitrary numbers of 50 meters squared? Thank you. So it says here it talks only of the foundation area, yet in the Norfolk County one we have what usable floor area, and over here we have original habitable ground floor area. So... Uh, does it appear that we're just making these things up as we go along and not going by the MNR tech guide at all? It sure sounds like. I mean, it really should be the foundation because really what is the hazard at the end of the day? It's what meets the ground. You know, if, if you can safely increase your foundation, why can't you have a second story? 
you know, really, we, if, if, we're, if really we want to follow the guidelines, then really what the Conservation Authority is suggesting is overly restrictive, and what's already in your plan, which is a reasonable compromise, is also unduly restrictive. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Colomayan. Mr. Rowe, speaking neutral or against, please. Good evening. Um, just to just to begin, I uh, first started to review the report. I was trying to get a handle on exactly what was in the report in terms of what was staff recommending, and uh, what ultimately would then go to the province for for approval. Um, the uh, staff report 18-07 uh, included uh, looking at the Cortland and the Delhi urban <coughs> boundaries, uh, in particular dealing with Scott, uh, uh, Scott's in Delhi and Titan uh, properties in, uh, in Cortland. Also looks at the uh, Oxford County's comment <coughs> with respect to the uh, Norfolk Mall and, and Long Point's uh, comments. Um, and if that were the case, if Council were to just deal with that and, and, and send uh, along the bylaw as it's presently written, uh, what wouldn't be included, and as Mary has actually uh, addressed this evening, is all of those changes that we had discussed with the various hamlets uh, some very minor expansions, uh, they wouldn't have been included and basically uh, they'd be removed and, and effectively dead. The problem with uh, settlement area boundaries, hamlet boundaries, is that you're only given an opportunity to look at those boundaries when you do a five-year review. It isn't a matter, well, we didn't get it to uh, this time uh, we'll wait a few months and put in an application. We've got to wait another five years. And, and I know personally getting to an age where I don't have that many more five-year reviews left in me. But uh, uh, so really what it comes down to is that uh, this is the opportunity to look at those boundaries and, and uh, an opportunity to do something with it. Uh, my clients, and I'll list them, uh, uh, Philly Farms, uh, they have property in uh, uh, West, uh, uh, Norfolk West. They're proposing to include one infill lot of an existing house. Uh, Jack Van Acker is proposing an additional lot in Andy's Corners. Jerry uh, Dudich is proposing an additional lot in Boston. John Wiggers is just proposing to be able to allow a number of existing lots that are adjacent to his property, allowing them to have another 50 or 100 feet so that their well and their septic system, which are presently on his property, could be on their property. Um, uh, John Smith in Walsh, what he was looking at is being able to have a little more in-depth development along the Turkey Point Road uh, for a proposed subdivision. And then lastly, Titan Trailers, Basically, you're just looking at acknowledging what is already built. And uh, uh, to object to that, I know the province is saying, well, okay, then you have to remove a corresponding amount of land out of uh, the uh, Cortland uh, settlement area. Well, it's already there. You look at that, the new plant they're building, uh, the existing plant, and what the province is saying is, well, if you don't, uh, it can't be included, and obviously its long-term use would be agriculture, which is, in my opinion, uh, not appropriate. I'm also representing uh, Solson Haulage. Uh, they were referred to in, uh, I believe, uh, area number one for removal from the, uh, from the Cortland settlement area in order to assist uh, Titan. The actual Hamlet uh, adjustments are only amounting to maybe three or four lots in the entire uh, 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 county. 
I myself are again somewhat suspect when you try to uh, look at well, what are all the potential lots and, and every time you look at them I'm sure you come up with a different figure. I mean if we can't accommodate three or four lots in this entire county that are kind of infill or add-on uh, in a hamlet, well uh, in my mind that policy is, is far too far too restrictive. Now uh, with respect to Titan, in my opinion because Titan is already existing, it's there, it's as built. We're just recognizing an existing uh, plant facility and including it within a uh, settlement area because it is that type of use. The policies of the province are to protect vacant farmland from being converted to uh, urban type uses. With that in mind, I don't know why we would have to uh, remove any because we're just simply acknowledging that yes, Titan is there, they've got a large plant. Um, it just uh, doesn't make sense that we have to remove some vacant land to recognize some already existing industrial facilities. And I remind uh, council that when we did the official plan amendment uh, for a portion of the Titan property that permitted where, where in fact, the new, uh, new facility is being built. Um, if, if it hadn't been Norfolk County and it had been the province, the approval authority, I can assure you that that new building wouldn't be there today. Uh, and you look at Titan, uh, creating additional jobs, 100 or plus more new jobs, uh, increased assessment. Uh, it just makes sense. Now, if you take a look at, uh, at uh, Cortland in general, Cortland is one of our best assets when it comes to future commercial or industrial type uses. It's got good access to the 401. Uh, you can get to the 401 without going through various urban areas. Uh, it's one of our best bets. And in the case of Solson, who've been asked to uh, uh, lose a, a portion of their land, they've already have a, uh, an offer purchase and sale on the back part that would be affected by this. Uh, I think that that sale could be in jeopardy should a, a piece of that, uh, that property be removed. Uh, again, uh, what we're looking at in the case of, of uh, Solson, the um, truck, uh, Voth uh, truck uh, uh, facility uh, has already expanded and they're looking to expand even further and they're the ones, in fact, interested in purchasing that additional land that's uh, behind their existing facility, which would be affected by uh, uh, the area number one. Uh, as far as, I guess, the, the, my clients in dealing with the, with the Hamlets, uh, they're, they're disappointed and they're frustrated by the process. They actively participated in an open process that, uh, and were given support to by council. And now uh, they're, they're, uh, what they had requested is being removed basically without a whisper. I noticed it was in one report, next thing it's, it's gone. Um, and frankly, uh, that really isn't fair. And as I suggested to Mary Elder on the phone this morning, I said, if it was council's intention to only uh, include in their amendment that that's been preordained or blessed by the province, they should have told us that two years ago. We could have really sped up the process and we wouldn't have to have had all the meetings that we've in fact had. Um, simply put, uh, the report with that are pre-blessed by the province, I'll use that phrase, uh, just makes council a rubber stamp for the province. And it's not fair to my clients, it's not fair to the residents of Norfolk County. Uh, the policies to be included in the Norfolk County Plan are there to serve the best interests of the, all the residents, the residents of, uh, 
of Norfolk County. The PPS and provincial policy are there to provide uh, planning guidance to the municipality, but uh, policy should, in our plan, be tailored to and meet the needs and goals of Norfolk County. Uh, the loss of, of uh, Titan to North, uh, of, of Titan for expansion in the province's great scheme of things, well, if it doesn't go to Norfolk, maybe it'll go to Oxford or maybe it'll go to Windsor. Uh, but we ha we're here to take care of the interests of the people who live in Norfolk County, who want to work in Norfolk County. And with that in mind, uh, I therefore request that council revise the recommendations that are in your staff report, include those changes that were previously supported to and uh, granted by council through the public participation uh, process. Uh, council needs to take these steps, in my opinion, to support the people of Norfolk County. And uh, I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, David. Council Wells. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I think you presented it very, very well. My question to you is, you know what the provincial policy is as well, if not better than most of us who yes. are sitting in this room. Yes. They have said that thou shalt. If we don't comply with them, and you're suggesting that we don't, what do you think the result of that might be? Well, I, it gives us an opportunity to negotiate uh, uh, further with the province. For example, um, I know that there uh, in the case of the hamlets, that there are some hamlets that have a lot of room for what they call in-depth development. But we also have policies in our plan that do not anticipate large subdivisions all on private services. Yet, there is a hamlet designation sitting on land that in all likelihood cannot be developed because we're not about to allow a 40-lot subdivision for example, in Langton, uh, on private services. Yet, that area is already designated uh, in the plan, and the province is saying, well, you've got lots of land designated. Well, it might be designated, but the likelihood of it being able to be developed and the likelihood of council supporting that development uh, are not particularly high. Uh, the uh, approval process with the province is, uh, is a matter of negotiations. Uh, for example, I do work in Brant County. Brant County still has estate lots. They haven't been here in 25 or 30 years. Uh, Brant County said to the province, no, we want to keep our estate lots, and they still have it in their plan. You know, it's a matter that... Uh, the province has to uh, feel that the municipality has certain rights and has certain, uh, it's not a, uh, a talk down to, it should be a talk to on equal ground. And as I said, for the matter of three or four lots, uh, you tell me that can't be accommodated. It's, uh, it just doesn't make sense. And I know in the case of uh, Forestville, uh, your planning staff had no trouble saying, yes, let's let some of those people have a, a bit more of a backyard so that they have the, their septic system on their own property. The province said, no. Well, because you could lose valuable agricultural land. Well, number one, we know that the provincial staff people didn't get out of the, get in their car and drive down to Forestville to take a look. <coughs> number one, they just looked at their policy and said, no, you got enough designated, under no circumstances can you have one square inch of anything further. Well, the world doesn't work that way. And we get to the point where we can't use a little bit of, I hate the word, common sense, and does it make sense? When we get to that point and we strictly just follow rules, black and white, well, why do we then have councils? Why do we have staff? Uh, they just lay out the rules and we all follow them and, and life is good. No, I, I don't really believe that. And I think that's part of the planning process is to look at these things, make rational arguments and deal with the province. It should be dealt with at a political level because 
they're one senior branch of, of government and municipalities and council uh, represent the, the, the lower tier, but a lot of people who in fact live here. You probably have more effect on people's daily lives by provision of the services that, that councils and municipalities provide than, than, than the province and certainly even the feds. However, we've got, a, we've got a bureaucracy set up there that is, sets the rules, puts them in black and white, and says to the municipality, well, that's it, and you just follow them. I, I don't really believe that that's the way it should be. Any other questions for Mr. Rowe? Before Mr. I Councilor Oliver? get on my... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. David, yeah. you heard the comments and the discussion we had early on in the staff report uh, regarding the Titan Trailers proposal and the yeah. Scott's proposal and the suggestion that we could, with willing property owners, accommodate roughly two-thirds of an equivalent swap, so to speak. Yeah. Are you, are you, will you be uh, pleased, should that go ahead and be approved? This yeah, summer? well, that, that's just again, just that yes again, no. yes. And, I, and okay. the reason I say is because that's part of the negotiation process. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Rowe. And thank you. I'll ask other members of the public to wish to speak against. Mr. Vandenbush, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, and staff. I'm really here for two purposes now. Um, the, the, the main reason I came here was uh, to speak on behalf of the, the Lawrences who own property in Port Dover. Um, I'll get into that in a minute. I just want to uh, comment on what the previous two speakers have said, and I agree wholeheartedly with what they're saying. Um, I think uh, I've heard for many, many years, Councillor Geisens and others say, why do we bother doing our planning if the province is going to govern us? We know better how to run our county. So... Uh, tying in with David Rowe just said, I, I just agree with that 100%. And I think uh, maybe the county has to stand up for its citizens. Um, it has to stand up for the other provincial interests which relate to uh, uh, economic viability of the municipalities and the provinces as a whole. We need that kind of industry like Titan Trailers and, and Scott's. Uh, and if you don't accommodate those people, what are you doing to the county? Uh, so and, and many others as well. So that's what I have to say about that. I also want to comment on the uh, uh, Councillor uh, Heights uh, about the, the lots. I, I've had the opportunity to have a look at the residential land uh, supply and uh, support uh, analysis. And I started anal analyzing it and uh, I can say one thing that Yes, uh, in this report there are these thousands of lots in the municipality, and it's a good thing. They even did break it down into communities. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that it's totally accurate with, the, with uh, what is buildable lots or available lots. Uh, many of these lots are at the edge of a hamlet, part of a farm, whose the farmer may not be interested in selling or subdividing it, especially if it's in an area where there's not high demand for housing. Um, Port Dover is a different story. Um, but there are many places around that, uh, on the west end of the province, or the uh, county, that, uh, yeah, we have all these lots in the municipality, but there's no market demand for them. And I know that from a grassroots level because I've been in the real estate business for 45 years. And I know how the demand is created here. And I could also say that in uh, Port Dover, for example, um, the, you're experiencing the big boom now. But that boom would have been two or three times as big if more land was available uh, over the last, since 2006 or 2007. Um, John Lennox, for example, at Dover Coast, after many, many years of waiting, he finally got his approval. He sold out phase one, 85 units, occupied in a matter of like 18 months. Um, Mr. Rigging, he sold out, he had expanded, he sold out. Uh, so, but we have 
all this other land, like the Dover West neighborhood planning area and the Dover Mills North, this is designated plan, uh, neighborhood planning areas and uh, it's only designated now, but there's never been sewage capacity to allow anybody to develop it.